Good morning and welcome to financial accounting for the fall 2021 semester. I believe this might be day 18. Looking at our calendar then, we finished up chapter eight last class, last Thursday. And so today the chapter eight problem should be submitted in CNOW. And we'll be starting chapter nine today. So the chapter nine pre-quiz is also expected to be submitted by the end of the day today. Remember, as always, 60% to get full credit for that, and anything less than 60% gets no credit. So you can keep answering those questions to until you get to that 60% mark before you hit submit for grading. Chapter 9 is a fairly lengthy chapter, and so it is not uh, impossible to think that some of chapter nine may spill over into next week. And that's okay, if we need to, we will just um, push some of the due dates a little bit, but we will do the best we can to stay on track with the two days for each chapter that we have set up. If we look ahead, chapter nine is the final chapter on our next exam and so we really need to finish chapter nine no later than Tuesday the second, which would be no problem. So if we if that happens, then the chapter nine exercises would get bumped to Tuesday, the chapter nine problem would get bumped to Thursday, and then you'd still have the weekend to complete that exam. Looking ahead even farther, our fourth exam is the exam that has just two chapters on it. So we cover 14 chapters, five exams. So most of them have three chapters, but there are only two chapters on the fourth exam. And that actually works out quite well with the timing of the, of the break for Thanksgiving. So we'll finish up chapter 11 on the 11th on Veterans Day. And then we will submit the problem by the 16th, and then you can take that fourth exam anytime before Thanksgiving. So just a reminder, we are off the entire week of Thanksgiving this year. So the 19th is the last day of classes before the break, and then we'll come back on the 29th. So for this class, then our last class will be the 18th, and we'll return on the 30th. Any questions about that administrative stuff? Yes, we do have class on Veterans Day. And um, if you are a veteran, we thank you for your service, of course. But I generally make it a policy that veterans don't have to, to have to submit anything on that day. So if you are a veteran, feel free to push those chapter 11 exercises to the following day. I know it is a holiday, a federal holiday, but it is a regular um, workday class day here at JCC. We normally have a, an observation of recognition ceremony on the 11th. I assume that will be happening this year as well, but I haven't heard anything about that to this point. It usually happens just before noon. People gather at the flagpole here on the on the Cattaraugus County campus in Olean, and I'm certain they do something similar in Jamestown as well. So COVID restrictions, of course, would apply, even though it's outside, you would need to social distance, um, possibly still wear masks, I'm not sure about that. Any questions, anything else you wanna talk about before we look at our new chapter. Any questions you might have from chapter eight related to accounts receivable, notes receivable, the allowance method, calculating simple interest, calculating due dates, any of the oh. concepts? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, on the chapter eight problem, I was I was a little confused. Um, yeah, I had I couldn't figure out what the interest rate was. I mean, I know what, what the formula is and everything, but it just, 
it just wasn't easy because it didn't say and give all the information. For yeah, them. Yeah, it, so it does give all the information, but let's take a look at that. Um, this one thing, and I actually like this about the problems. Most of them are, require you to do things maybe in a little bit different order or to fit the pieces together a little bit differently. So um, even when I'm looking at the problems, I need to be very careful to make sure I'm reading what's actually there and not reading something that I think they meant. But the question specifically that you just mentioned, Seth, about calculating the interest rate. Let me see if I can find that. So that was here. Yeah. So let me just give you a, um, a bit of direction there how to calculate this interest rate. So the formula that we have for interest, simple interest, is interest for I equals principal times interest rate times time. And so the first step for this was to find the term of the note that is going to be the T part of your formula. So if you've already done that, you don't have to say it out loud, but if you've already done that, that's gonna plug in here to our formula for the time. Now, what we're asked to find here is the interest rate of the note. So it's this R part that's the missing piece. So you can plug in and then solve for rate, or if you prefer, um, you can just adjust this formula to solve for rate first and then start plugging in. So to do that, we would take the formula as it is and divide both sides by principal and time to get rate by itself. So we would end up with some a formula that looks like this. Interest divided by principal would be Mathematically, this is the same formula. It's the same pieces. We have just solved for a for rate rather than the interest in dollars. So now we should be able to plug in. Again, the interest is given right here. That's the interest that had accrued on the note. The principal is right here. That's the $11,250 that was the face value of the note. And the final piece is the time, which you just calculated, should have just calculated here as the number of days, the maturity length of that note. And remember, you need to convert it into portion of the year. It says to use a 360 day year. So whatever number of days you found for number one, you just divide that by 360 as you're plugging into the formula here. Seth, does that help with how to calculate that? Yes, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. So again, it's not a, this is not a typical scenario. This is not something you would see in the real world, but the way they put these extra, these problems together, the comprehensive problems that we've been doing makes you kind of think about, okay, what do we know? How, do, how are these, what we do know? How is this information related? And it does encourage us to step back and not just continue to do things exactly the way we've done them time and time again in the exercises and so on, but to actually critically reflect on, yeah, but what does all this mean? So frequently, as I said, not, these are not realistic scenarios that we wouldn't know the interest rate. Of course we would know the interest rate because we are the ones who um, you know, received that note. We were the payees on the note. We would know what the interest rate is, but they set it up in such a way that it, it makes us think a little bit harder about that. Anything else that I can answer for you before we start the new chapter? Hopefully anyone who needed it has made a note of what we just did. I'm going to clear that. I can get back to the chapter nine exercises where we will need to be in just a minute or two from now. Anybody else with questions? Okay. So 
So let's start with our introduction for chapter nine then. Chapter nine, I have been mentioning this chapter literally since chapter three, because our focus in this chapter is going to be mostly on, on property plant and equipment and calculating depreciation and how do we record that. We're really going to walk through the entire life cycle of a long-term asset, a, a fixed or plant asset, something that is a tangible asset. So if you look at the learning objectives here, we've got some on the next page, the next slide as well. Most of our exercises, most of our time is going to be spent on learning objectives one, two, and three. Those are the most critical pieces of this because I would suggest that virtually all companies have fixed assets, that is property, plant, and equipment, where many companies do not have what you see mentioned in objective four and objective five, that is natural resources and intangible assets. So those are going to take up a lot less of our time because they're a lot less widely applicable. As I suggested, starting in chapter three, we are going to be looking at three different ways of calculating depreciation. So we've talked about depreciation in a couple different chapters now, but we have not, up to this point, we've just been given the dollar amount of the depreciation without having to worry about where did that number come from? How did they figure that? So that's going to, again, be the focus of, of, our, of our chapter. Let's go to the next slide then. And we will talk about how we use this information to, to evaluate our company and how we report that depreciation or depletion and amortization, which are the two terms that we'll see with natural resources and with, um, with intangible assets. You'll notice that this um, this slide shows a learning objective for the appendix, as is always the case. We do not cover the appendix. We have enough to cover without worrying about that. So I don't do not need to worry about that um, learning objective or anything in the appendix. It will not be on our exercises. It will not be in the problem. It will not be on the exam. So I've been throwing out a lot of terms for the same concept, a fixed asset. You can see the other ones that I have used here, plant assets, property, plant, and equipment. These are long-term tangible assets. They have a physical substance to them. We can see them, we can touch them. And the fact that they are being classified as fixed assets tells us that they are being used in the normal course of operations. So the same type of asset can be classified in different ways. Let's take a, a car, a, a vehicle. If we are a car dealership, that vehicle is probably part of our merchandise inventory, right? We're not going to classify it as a long-term asset. We hope that we're not going to have it long-term. The intent is that it is available for sale to our customers and we will sell it in the near term. So that same vehicle if it was a the loaner car that they use for, for when cars are in, in their repair shop, that could be a fixed asset, something that the company did not plan to sell. Um, think about a building. So I usually here on the Cattaraugus County campus, I used to use, if you look out the window, for those of us who are on campus, you see our newest building on campus, which is the MTI building. You may remember when something else was there, um, right next to campus for the first about 10 years that I worked here, that was the Knights of Columbus. So there was the, their um, house and an attached bingo hall that they, um, where they had bingo every, I don't know, Tuesday night or something. And so several, many years ago now, several, JCC acquired that property from the Knights of Columbus who were looking to, to sell and, and move out of that location. And 
it made sense for JCC to buy it because our property borders it um, on two sides of um, former dimensions of our property. At the time we bought it, there were certainly some, some concepts of what we might use it for, but we, it, you know, we don't get to just throw up a new building. Obviously the money has to come from somewhere. We have to get permission from the state, from the, our local sponsor, which happens to be Catarata County here. We have to secure funding and, and have those plans approved. And so there was quite a gap between the time that we acquired the property and we started working on it. When we started working on it, it turned out there was asbestos and it was a whole big, you know, it took a much longer period of time to get that the former building removed. There had been an intent to keep part of the building, part of the bingo hall, which was newer. Um, the concrete slab that underlies that they thought would be usable for our purposes. Turns out it wasn't, and so they end up having to remove everything, go down to you know, bare ground, and then build from the bottom, literally from the bottom up. And so where, how does this connect with what we're talking about? Well, from the time that we acquired that property, until the current structure, the MTI, Mechanical Technical Manufacturing Technical Institute, is what it's called, MTI. Um, from the time we acquired the build, the property until it was ready to use, we did not classify that as a plant asset or a fixed asset. Instead, it was an investment for us. But that's not at all uncommon for companies to acquire a piece of property that they don't in immediately put into use. And so if we think about the matching principle, the matching principle tells us you record revenues when you burn them, match against them the expenses that helped us to generate those revenues. Well, when JCC had a, a you know, an empty building sitting next door, it wasn't being used to generate any revenues yet. There was certainly a plan for how that might happen in the future. But at the time, it wasn't generating generating any revenues. And so from our perspective, it would not have made any sense to record any expense for that building that wasn't being used um, to generate revenues. So that same building, if we had used, if we had kept the existing building and then started to use it after a couple of years, at that point, it would become a plant asset while it was sitting vacant and unused it would be considered an investment. We're holding that for the future. So in summary, a, a plant asset some, is something that is subject to depreciation and being used in the normal course of operations. It is not being held for future use or for sale. It is not um, available for sale to our existing customers. And so for that reason, um, when something is a fixed asset and being used in the normal course of operations, the matching principle says, okay, now you need to be recording the expense associated with that. That same cost can, uh, so let me, look at these steps and talk about this for just a moment. When, we have, when we're trying to decide how do we classify this, is it, is it a fixed asset, is it a long, uh, investment, or should it just be an expense in the current period? We first have to ask ourselves, well, how long are we going to have it? If we're going to have it for more than one accounting period, so more than one year generally, then it should be classified as long-term. And the matching principle tells us that we should be spreading that cost or expense over that period of time that we intend to use it. So once we know it's long-term, then we ask, is it used in normal operations? If yes, then we're going to what's called capitalize it or put it on the balance sheet and then write it off over time as an expense. If we're not using it in normal operations, as I just discussed with the the former building next door, we classify it as an investment and we don't need to make any changes or record any expense as long as it's not being used in operations. I will add one more question here for us. 
And that question is, is it material? Is it a large enough amount to matter? And so those of you who are here in the classroom, I think get the button period over here so people on camera can see. I'm holding in my hands. Let me make sure I you guys can see. I am holding here in my hand a recycle. Oh, you can't see the recycles. So it is a recycle bin that sits here in the classroom. I have been teaching in this building now for 19 years. And I suspect that that same recycle bin has been here for all of those 19 years. I think I started teaching here uh, one year after this building, this building, the tech building opened. So does that recycle bin meet our definitions in the steps that we can see on this flow chart? Is it long lived? Well, yeah, it's been here for 20 years. Is it used in normal operations? Yes, we've been using it for 20 years, throwing recycle in there. And so by this flow chart, that recycle bin should be listed as a fixed asset on JCC's balance sheet. Now, do we think that makes sense? How much do you suppose one of those cost? We probably get them on some kind of state contract. So hopefully that means you know, with the bulk purchasing of all 64 SUNY sites, hopefully a little bit cheaper than if I were just to walk into you know, Walmart and buy one or whatever. But, so technically it is a fixed asset and it is being used in the normal operations. And so by that definition, we should have been for 20 years or some period recording that cost gradually over that 20 year period. Let's just say, I have no idea how much they cost. Let's just say it costs $20 for the sake of, of easy math. And let's say it's expected life at the time it was purchased was 20 years. Again, keeping my math simple. So under normal rules for depreciation, if it costs $20 and it is going to be used for 20 years, one way to record that would be to just record $1 worth of expense every year for 20 years. And that makes sense. But when we step back and think about this critically, do we think that's a material amount? Is there anyone looking at JCC's financials that if they knew about this $1 a year expense for the recycle can in tech 207, I think this room is, is there anyone who would make a different decision about JCC based on knowing or not knowing about that $1 worth of depreciation? No, it sounds silly, right? But that is the, the third step that's kind of left out of this picture is it needs to be a material amount. So every business is going to establish a threshold of what is considered a material amount for a capital expenditure. And that is going to make the decision about whether that asset lands on the balance sheet and gets depreciated, or if we just write it off as an expense at the time that it's purchased. So we would actually take this no route. Um, yes, it's long live, but it's not material. And so we're just going to write it off as an expense at the time that it's acquired. Now, to take that one step further, I said when that showed up here was probably 20 years ago when this building opened. So it's probably not the only recycle bin that was acquired at that time. And a company or an organization, an entity may look at a bulk purchase and say, you know, one of them isn't big enough to capitalize, but 40 of them or 40, you know, 4,000, I have no idea, 400 of them, maybe they bought them for the entire college at once. That might be big enough, might be. Um, and I look around the room here, there are 26 plus mine, 27 computers. And these computers were brand new. Um, I think over the summer, certainly, if not over the summer, definitely in the spring semester. So they're, they're brand new computers. Even though um, one of the computers may not reach our threshold of being material. So 
you know, and how, how big is material depends on the size of the organization. So what is material for JCC is maybe a lower threshold than what is material for the University of Buffalo, which is a much larger institution. If we look at just one of these computers and the cost of one computer, it would not meet the threshold. But if we look at the entire classroom, or if we look at all of the computers that were purchased at one time this spring or summer, whenever these were acquired, that probably exceeds the threshold and would be a capital expenditure, land on the balance sheet and be written off or reported as depreciation expense over time. Is making sense? So we go back all the way to chapter one. Why do we do this stuff in the first place? So that decision makers have useful information to help them make decisions. So before we do a journal entry every year to record $1 of expense for my little recycle bucket in this classroom, we have to ask ourselves the question, does that even make sense? Would that help a decision maker make a better, more informed decision? And in general, the answer to that for a Recycle bin would be no. Give me one second. I just need to update my attendance here. Nope. So some examples um, of bigger categories of long-term assets, buildings, machinery and equipment, land and land improvement. I'm not going to read through all of those bullet points. You can see this slide in the PowerPoint that you have access to on the textbook resources website, or you can see it in the book. But what I want you to notice here, and we're going to go to our first exercise in just a moment, is the types of costs that become part of the cost of acquiring a long-term asset. It's not just the sticker price, if you will. It's all of the costs of acquiring that piece of, of uh, fixed asset and getting it ready for its intended purpose. So it's going to include any taxes, fees, transportation, setup, installation, any special training. All of that can become part of the cost of the asset itself. Now for our first exercise, we're really going to be focusing on this distinction. What is considered part of the land and what is considered part of the land improvements. So the cost of the land that goes on our balance sheet includes all of the costs of getting the land ready to build on it. So if we were to, for example, um, there's a bullet point here, um, removing unwanted building less than a salvage. So if we had purchased, um, we did purchase this property next door and we determined that removing the Knights of Columbus building, including the bingo hall, was going to be part of our plan, the cost of removing the building becomes part of the cost of the land. The cost of removing the concrete of the asbestos abatement and everything else that went into that becomes part of the cost of the land. Once we started building on top of the land, whether it's to put in a parking lot, no, there was no extra parking from that building, but putting in a parking lot, putting up lighting signage for that parking lot, all of that is considered land improvements, things that were built on top of the land. Why does it matter? Why am I spending minutes when I said time is precious this week for this chapter? Why am I spending so much time talking about this? Well, Land is the single long-term asset, property, plant, and equipment that is not subject to depreciation. When we acquire a piece of land, we record it at what we paid for it, including all of these potential additional costs. And we keep it at that value for the entire time we have the land, unless, unless we believe the value has gone down if it has experienced a loss of value, an impairment of the value, then we write down the value. But land is not subject to depreciation. So it is important that we categorize the cost correctly. You know, the, the inclination is to get as much cost as we can into that land account because then we never have to record expense associated with it. But our job as accountants is to be ethical about the way we 
allocate those costs. Let's go to our first exercise. First exercise for chapter nine, determining cost of land. On-time delivery company acquired an adjacent lot to construct a new warehouse, paying $90,000 in cash and giving a short-term note for $50,000. Legal fees were paid were $1,750, delinquent taxes assumed were $25,000, and fees paid to remove an old building from the land were $9,000. Materials salvaged from the demolition of the building were sold for $1,000. And then a contractor was paid $415,000 to construct the new warehouse. So our job for this exercise is to determine of all of these dollar amounts that the that on-time delivery paid out to acquire the land, to get it ready, to actually have the warehouse available for use before it became a um, before it became a part of our normal course of operations. Of all of these costs what would be classified as land, what could possibly be classified as an expense in the current period, and I'm gonna take it one step further, what, how would we report the building part of this as well for the warehouse? Because the, the cost of the building is going to be subject to depreciation, will be written off over, over some period of time. So let me just get my annotate function up here. And we will put a star by the ones that, that become part of the land. So they paid $90,000 in cash to acquire the adjacent lot. Clearly that's part of the cost of the land, right? That is the sticker price, if you will. But they also borrowed $50,000 to help pay for that land. So they could pay for part of it in cash. They made a down payment of 90,000, but they, it cost an additional 50,000 that they had to borrow. Now, thinking about that slide I just had up, legal fees, if we hadn't paid these legal fees, we wouldn't have been able to acquire the land. So it's definitely part of the cost of acquiring that land. We also had to pay the delinquent taxes that the former owner of the land uh, was behind. There was an old building on the land. We had no intention of using that building. And so we had to pay to remove it. Again, it's part of getting the, the land flat and level and, and ready for its intended purpose. Other costs, um, such as grading the property, removing any um, trees or um, garbage, anything that was on the land that needed to be removed, all of that would be part of the cost of the land itself. Now, some of the materials from that building were able to be salvaged and sold. And so that actually reduces the amount that we have to pay. And so we're going to reduce the total by 1,000. Finally, a contractor was paid 415,000. That clearly is the cost of the building. So let's do some quick math here. We're going to add up all of the gold starred items and subtract the $1,000 salvage. If I add it correctly, hopefully I did. I got $174,750. Does that match what anyone else got? And then the, as I said, the $415,000 would be allocated to the building, the warehouse. So what would this look like in our accounting record? Well, it would look something like this. I'm, I'm doing this as a summary entry. I realize that some of those fees were paid to people other than the, the purchaser or the seller of the land and that those were probably paid out over time. I'm just going to do one summary entry. For the land, 
you said the total was $174,750. For the building, we said that was $415,000. And how did we pay for this? Well, the notes payable, we were told was $50,000. Oops. And I'm, I am just going to assume I'm going to assume that all the rest of these things, other than that note payable, that all the rest of it was paid in cash because I don't, we don't need to go through that extra step. Just calculating how much do I need to make this balance. And I got 539,750. So what I wanted you to see is, is the entry to record, again, in summary, this would have happened up over a number of different um, costs, but all of those additional pieces, the legal fees, the delinquent taxes, they don't get reported as expenses. They don't get um, debited to anything other than the land because that's all of that is part of the cost of acquiring the land. We may have picked up some other liabilities. We may have a mortgage on the building, for example. I don't know, but I'm just for the sake of, of ease, uh, assuming we paid cash for it. Yeah. If we're doing this all as a summary entry, where would we put the uh, materials from the building that we salvaged? Yeah, so there we would have just credited that to the, if we were doing that as a separate entry, we would have credited that to the land account. Debited cash because it says we sold them for $1,000. We would have debited cash for 1,000, credited the uh, land for one, make sure I say the right thing, the land for 1,000. Okay. So, it, and yeah, it would have been a separate entry, right? But it's easier for us for what, what I wanted you to see just to put them all together. Yep. So all I did to find the amount for the cash was add together the two debits that I knew and subtract the one credit that I knew to figure out how much must have uh, net come out of our cash. So an important note here, again, the only thing we needed to do for this exercise was to determine the cost of the land. But I want you to think about, about what this means. Everything I just did in this journal entry is a balance sheet account, land, building, both assets, cash, asset, notes payable, liability, current liability because it says it's a short-term note. So buying the land, building the building did not help us generate any revenues, did not help us make any money. It was a balance sheet transaction. It doesn't affect the income statement at all. We just spent, by my reckoning, over $500,000 of our cash, but this does not affect our income statement. At the very end of this semester, in December, um, chapter 13, we will be looking at the cash flow statement and we will come back to this idea that yes, it's a cash flow, but it doesn't show up on our income statement. There's a big difference between what's on our income statement and what's on our cash flow statement. We have lots of sources and uses of cash that don't like this, buying this building or building this building and buying the land that actually don't affect our income statement. Now that we have the building, we can start using it. And at the point that it becomes part of our normal course of operations, that we're actually using that new building now it becomes a plant asset and we can start recording expense because it's helping us run our business. The matching principle tells us that's what needs to happen. You don't record expense if it's not helping with generating revenues. If it's not being used in the normal course of operation. So this is the very first part of the life cycle of a long-term asset or property, plant, and equipment. 
we acquire it. We record it on our balance sheet, including all of the costs that went into acquiring it and getting ready for its in, getting it ready for its intended purpose. Everybody good so far? Let me clear my stuff off the screen. And I'll get the green, our single little green check mark on there. And we are going to move on. So let me go back. Go back to our presentation. So now we get to the concept of depreciation. We recorded the asset, we own it, now we start using it. At the time we start using it, we need to start reflecting some of that upfront cost as, um, as an expense on our income statement. And the special term that we have for that that we introduced the term in chapter three when we did adjusting entries is depreciation. What you need to note is that depreciation is not an attempt to make the asset on our balance sheet show at what we could sell it for, right? Assets depreciate on our income statement, or excuse me, on our balance sheet, on our financial statements because we are using them and we're taking that upfront cost and spreading it out. It's just an accounting technique to take that upfront cost and spread it out over the useful life of the asset. How much of that are we going to use up? Let's divide that up over the life of the asset. So at any given time on, on our balance sheet, the asset may be worth more than what our balance sheet says it's worth. It might be worth less than what our balance sheet says it's worth in a very extremely unlikely circumstance, it may be worth exactly what our balance sheet says. That's not the point. The point is to take that upfront cost and spread it out over the useful life of the asset. So we're going to be looking at, as I already mentioned, three different ways of taking that upfront cost and dividing it up. In total, under all three methods, the expense we report is the same in total over the life of the asset. So it's just a different way of dividing it up across that lifespan. I need to, and I, this is what I just talked about. So I need to point out to you in Blackboard, there is, I should probably go show that to you now. In Blackboard, if you go to the reference materials folder area and go down to the chapter that we're currently covering, chapter nine, you'll notice there is an extra piece in the chapter nine folder, appreciation methods, terms, and formulas. So I would, ref I would encourage you to reference this until you're familiar with the costs and the formulas. These formulas that I, Given starting here, uh, these are the three methods, straight line, units of activity or units of production is another term for that, and double declining or DDB, double declining balance is an accelerated method of reporting depreciation. So I will be using these formulas over the next couple exercises here today and also referring to these terms. So. Let's go through those terms now so that as I use them in our next exercise, um, you understand what I'm talking about. So historical cost is the total cost, the upfront cost. And we just saw the slide and talked about the types of costs that would be included in that upfront cost. It's not just the sticker price, it's all of the costs of acquiring that asset and getting it ready for its intended purpose. For each of those items, each of the long-term assets we acquire, we have to make an estimate of how long we're going to use it and how much it will be worth when we're done. Okay, two estimates. The upfront cost is a, I'm gonna use quotation marks, it's a real cost. We know exactly, it's a, it's a precise dollar amount that that asset cost for us to acquire normally. But two estimates go into these calculations. 
how long are we going to use the asset and how much is it going to be worth? What will its value be when we are done? How long we're going to use it, we refer to as the estimated useful life. We might estimate it in years or in, in time, but we might also estimate it based on some other um, measure of its usefulness. So if it's a vehicle, maybe we've decided we're going to keep it until it has 50,000 miles on it. If it's a machine, maybe we decide we're going to keep it until it has clocked X number of machine hours. If it is a building, we're probably going to measure its usefulness in years, right? So we have to estimate the useful life and we have to estimate how much it's going to be worth when we are done using it. And so there are really three choices. It might be worth nothing. We might have to just throw it away. Okay. We could have a zero residual return for that estimated um, value at the end of its useful life is residual value, salvage value, scrap value, trade-in value. I will mostly use the term residual value. I just like that term best. And so that's what you see here in my, in my formulas. Residual, a residue is something that's left. So residual value is how much of that value is left at the end of its useful life. Clearly there's a, a strong connection between how long are we going to use it and how much is it going to be worth? If you buy a car and you only have it for three years, it's going to be worth more than if you buy a car and keep it for 10 years, right? Same thing is true for any asset the business would buy. So we can't separate those two pieces. How long are we going to use it? How much is it going to be worth, do we think? Those are both estimates. That means neither one of them is likely to be exactly true. We hope we're close, but we have to estimate these amount these uh, amounts up front. So historical cost is the full all-in cost. Depreciable cost is that historical cost minus how much we think it's going to be worth when we're done using it, the estimated residual value. So another way of looking at depreciable cost is how much of the value, the original upfront cost, are we going to use up? And that depreciable cost is the total depreciation we are going to record over the useful life of that asset. Depreciable cost is the total depreciation we will record while we're using that asset. And then carrying value or book value, book value is another term for that. Carrying or book value, we saw that term back in chapter three, it's what gets reported on our balance sheet the original or historical cost. Then we show all of the depreciation that has been reported up to that point, the accumulated depreciation. The difference between those two is the amount that our, our balance sheet shows that asset is currently worth. As I already indicated, that doesn't mean that's its market value. If we went to sell the asset today, we might be able to sell it for more than what our book said it was worth, less than our book said it was worth, or in a very unlikely circumstance, exactly what our books say it's worth. As I suggested already, that residual value might be zero. When we're done using an asset, it may have no value. We may have used all of its value and we just have to throw it away, dispose of it. We might actually have to pay someone to take it off our hands, right? But of course, the other option is we might get someone to pay us something for it, which may be more or less than what our books say it's actually worth. Might be more or less than we had estimated it would be worth. So those are the terms that we need to be familiar with. I'll be using those as we look at our, at our next exercises. Exercise number two uses the unit of activity method. So before we go to that exercise, I'd just like you to take note, maybe actually make a note or be ready to jump toggle back and forth. You can see the calculation here. At the time that we acquire the asset, we are going to estimate its useful life, but it's not gonna be in years or months or days, it's going to be in some units of activity, miles driven, hours used, something like that. And we're going to estimate the residual value of the asset. So at the time we acquire the asset, we can already calculate 
and we will have done, already we can already calculate the per unit depreciation. We can calculate how much is this car vehicle going to cost us per mile. Okay. And then when we're actually using that vehicle, we can calculate the depreciation by multiplying that unit cost that we know up front by the actual units of production, by the actual miles driven if it's a vehicle. So let's go to our exercise exercise two. And the first thing we're going to do is utilize those terms that we just saw. So let's identify, as I read this exercise, let's identify what these, what these uh, numbers are that they told us. The cost, the historical cost is $120,000. A diesel powered tractor with a cost of $120,000. That's the original upfront cost. Again, that's not the sticker price. That's the all in cost. It includes any taxes, shipping, trans, you know, anything else of getting that, tra acquiring the tractor and getting it to us so that we can actually use it. It tells us it actually uses the term residual value. The residual value we expect, okay, remember it's an estimate. We expect the residual value to be $16,400. So using the terms that I just introduced, what is the depreciable cost here? How much of the upfront cost of that tractor are we going to use up? It is, using the formula I just showed you, the historical cost minus the residual value. That's the amount of the upfront cost that we are going to use up $103,600. Over the life of this tractor, diesel powered tractor, as we're using the tractor, we are going to record a total of $103,600 in depreciation over the life of the tractor. That is true regardless of whether we use the straight line method, the units of activity method, the double declining balance method, doesn't matter what method we use, the total depreciation will be the same. The only difference between the three methods or among the three methods is the timing. Double declining balance is an accelerated method. It's going to record more at the beginning and much less at the end of the useful life of that asset. Straight line means we record the same amount every year. Okay, that's what straight line means. It's flat and level, same every year. The production or the units of activity method that we're doing here means that in years that, that we use it more, we're gonna be recording more expense. And in years that we use the tractor less, we're going, to re re we're going to be recording a lower amount of expense. So we're really mat getting a better match between the cost of the tractor and the revenues it's helping us to generate. Questions so far? So the next thing we need to calculate then is the unit cost of using this tractor, unit cost. And looking, thinking about those formulas or referring to those formulas I just showed you in Blackboard. To find the unit cost, we take the depreciable cost and we divide it by the estimated useful life. But again, the life is not gonna be based on the calendar, the passage of time. It's not gonna be per month, per year. It's going to be based on the usage of this asset. And in this case, we're recording it based on the number of hours the tractor is used. So 103,600 divided by 28,000 hours gives us a unit cost of $3.70 per hour. We calculate that up front. As a matter of fact, that may be part of our discussion of is this the right tractor for us? Well, I don't know how much is it going to cost us? Is it going to be worth it? So we definitely would be calculating that unit cost of, of the tractor as part of that conversation is should we buy the tractor at all? 
now we actually start using the tractor. When we acquired the tractor, we did a journal entry to record, I'm just gonna pretend that we paid cash for it. The time we acquired it, we did a journal entry that looked like this. Actually, you know what, maybe rather than doing that, I'll just put, uh, I'll put T accounts on here so we can actually follow what we're, what we're doing. Let me put some T accounts on here. And I should put one more. Here. So I've just abbreviated a little bit. I have a T account that I made far too big for the tractor. When we acquire the tractor, again, I'm assuming we paid cash for it. So it's a balance sheet transaction. We haven't used the tractor yet. So we report it like that. We exchange one asset cash for another asset tractor. We've asked ourselves the question, is this a long live asset? Yes, we plan to use it for 28,000 hours. Presumably that's over more than one year. And it is meets some threshold of materiality. It's a fairly substantial purchase. And so it's going to go on the balance sheet. We're going to use it in the normal course of operation. So it is part of property, plant, and equipment. We have calculated up front that the tractor is going to cost us $3.70 per hour. Now that does not include any maintenance, any gas, any diesel, the diesel, um, any oil changes, whatever else the tractor might need. That's on top of this depreciation of $3.70 per hour. Those, those other costs I just mentioned, the routine maintenance, the, um, the cost of running it are expenses. Those are operating expenses. They don't go on the balance sheet. They get expensed in the period in which they're incurred. Now it tells us that during the month of April, we operated the tractor for 150 hours. We already know the cost of the, the tractor itself is $3.70 per hour. So in a month that we used it for 150 hours at $3.70 per hour, the total expense that we would record would be $555. And the entry, as we learned in chapter three, the entry always looks the same except for the dollar amount. It doesn't matter which of the three methods we're using. It doesn't matter the dollar amount. It doesn't matter whether we're using um, units of activity or straight line. It doesn't matter what type of depreciable asset it is. The adjusting entry to record the depreciation will always be a debit to depreciation expense up for that asset and a credit to the accumulated depreciation for that asset. And we know the total. And it says to, to carry out any division to two decimal places. So I guess I can put my, my two decimal places, my two zeros on there. There were not actually any decimals. Now I want to take this a little bit farther and, and keep talking. Any questions about where that number came from though? So I don't know if 150 hours for the month is a high month or a low month. I'm gonna pretend it's a low month. And so at the end of that month, we closed our books. We zero out any temporary accounts. So that 555, $555 of depreciation expense would get reported on the income statement, it reduces our net income. When we close our books, that gets rolled into retained earnings. The accumulated depreciation, as we learned in chapter three, 
is a contra asset account. Just gonna leave, I don't know if this is gonna show up or not. No, not really. That accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. It has a normal credit balance. Unlike the allowance that we saw in the last chapter that I said, yeah, it's a normal credit balance, but it could have a debit balance. This accumulated depreciation never has anything but a credit balance. It will always have a credit balance and it goes against the asset. So at the end of this first month on our balance sheet, what we would see under a tractor, if we were looking at enough detail, we would see the tractor, we would see its historical cost of $120,000. We would see the accumulated depreciation of $555 because I'm assuming this is the first month that we've used it. And then we would see the book or carrying value, which as we saw on that formula sheet in Blackboard is the 120 minus the 555. So the book value at the end of April would be 119,000, what is that, $445. Now we use it for another month and let's say we use it for a thousand hours just because it makes my math simple. If we use it for a thousand hours, we are going to report another $3,700 in depreciation expense and add another $3,700 to our accumulated depreciation. Again, when we close our books, the depreciation expense is zeroed out, rolled into net income, rolled into retained earnings. The accumulated depreciation continues to accumulate. By the time we have driven this tractor for 28,000 hours, 28,000 hours at $3.70 per hour, the accumulated depreciation account would have in it a total of $103,600. That is 28,000 hours at $3.70 per hour. At the end of the useful life of this asset, assuming we drive it or use it for exactly the 28,000 hours that we had estimated up front, the final book or carrying value at that time would be 120,000 minus 103,600. the original or upfront cost minus the accumulated depreciation is the book or carrying value. And that amount is, I'll just go over a little bit more. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of run over that, I apologize. I'll change the color so it yeah, doesn't really stand out. I tried $16,400, where have I seen that number before? It was what we estimated before we even start, before we even bought the tractor, we had estimated that it would have a residual value of 16,400. If we use it exactly for the amount of time we estimated, whether it's in years or in this case in, in hours, the carrying value will be exactly the residual value. That must be how it comes out. If we use it for exactly the period of time we had estimated, it will come down to that estimated residual value. Everybody with me so far? Make sense? Anybody, questions? Sometimes I really feel like there's a really teacher around here. I'm gonna go ahead and put the green check mark in there. But so we can see how, how these how the units of activity method is used, but also how it would be reported both on the income statement for the annual or monthly depreciation and on the balance sheet. The tractor account will always, unless we make some uh, major substantial repairs or something like that, the tractor account will always show what we paid for it, the historical cost. The accumulated depreciation account will continue to climb 
as we use that asset for a longer and longer period until it reaches the full depreciable cost, right? Here's our depreciable cost. It matches the total depreciation that we report. If we use it for the expected period of time, that will always be the case. Let's keep going then. And in our next exercise, we will look at the other two methods of reporting or recording calculating depreciation. Start out with those same concepts or terms that we saw in the last chapter. I'm actually gonna put this down. So the cost of 85,000 is the historical cost. The estimated useful life is 10 years. And we're told to assume that it has no residual value. In other words, if we use it for 10 years, we think we will have totally used up, taken all of the usefulness of the asset. We're not even suggesting we could sell it for scrap metal, right? So we're assuming zero. That's not likely, but we'll pretend. Um, it does make our math easier. Thinking about the formulas that I showed you in Blackboard, for the straight line method, we take the depreciable cost. Well, when there is no, when there is no residual value, the depreciable cost is the historical cost. We expect to use up all $85,000 of the value of this asset. For a straight line method, rather than dividing by the useful life in hours or miles driven or whatever, we express the useful life as a period of time and is simply the passage of time that is going to um, trigger the, the expense. So $8,500 per year. Annual depreciation of $8,500. Remember I told you that the straight line method means that we record the same amount every year. Now that assumes these are full years. So let me just point this out. This exercise suggested that we acquired this tractor on January 8th. You will notice in almost all the exercises we do, when we are given an acquisition date, it's in the first half of the first month of the, of the fiscal year. First half of the first month. What that means is, as long as it's acquired in the first half of the first month, we can record a full year of depreciation for that first year. If it was acquired on January 17th, we would only report 11 and a half months of depreciation. If it was acquired on July 1st, we would only, and we use a calendar year, we would only report six months of depreciation. So it is significant. There's a reason they told us it was acquired on January 8th, and that's so that we know we can report a full year of depreciation. Again, makes our math easier, um, but how often does that actually happen? That it's acquired in the first half of the first month? I don't know, statistically speaking, they might be all equally likely, so one in 24 times. You know, um, It does make our math easier, but I want you to Keep that in mind, we would have to know when it was acquired to determine whether a, per, a full first year of depreciation was warranted. And if not, then we would report a partial year the first year. We'd report nine straight years of full year depreciation, and then we'd have a little bit left to carry over into that. Um, so that would be year 11. Partial year in year one, partial year in year 11 for a total of 10 years. Now look at, let's look at the double declining balance method. So the double declining balance method really um, follows the straight line method in terms of the calculation, except, let's go back to the formula, except. For the straight line method, the numerator, what we put in the, in the top part of that calculation was the depreciable cost. But if you look down here, you'll notice that what we're multiplying by for the double declining balance method, DDB or accelerated method is the carrying value. In other words, 
we don't take into account the residual value. We don't take into account the residual value. When we use the double declining balance method, we only pay attention to that residual value when we get closer to the end of the life cycle of the asset. And we're not going to see as much of a difference in this exercise because unfortunately, they told us that there was no residual value. The residual value makes a much bigger difference for this particular um, approach. Annotate function up here and let's use that formula. So we start with the, um, I'm gonna use, I wanna use the formula the same way I have it in Blackboard so that you can see how it works. The formula that I showed there was two divided by the useful life. So you'll notice in the straight line method, we just divided by 10. Now we're essentially dividing by five, right? We're, we're reporting twice as much. Two divided by the useful life times the carrying value. So the carrying value when we first acquire the asset is the full historical cost. We haven't yet reduced that by any depreciation. I'm going to go back. I want to label this year one. So two divided by the useful life times the carrying value, which right now is $85,000. And I got $17,000. $17,000. It is twice as much as the straight line method. So I tell why it's called double declining balance because we add that two into the formula. If there was a residual value, we would see even more of a difference between what you would do under straight line and what you would do under the DDP. Let's move on to year two so you can see the difference here. We still use that factor two over the use of life, but now the carrying value is no longer $85,000 because last year, year one, we reported $17,000 in, in depreciation and therefore reduced our carrying value by that $17,000. So at the end of year one, our carrying value is now $68,000. And then we multiply that by 2 tenths. And in year two, we report $13,600 in depreciation. And I'm just using that formula from Blackboard. Two divided by the useful life times the carrying value. And the formula for carrying value is also in Blackboard. It's the original or historical cost less the accumulated depreciation. Beyond what the exercise asks us, but I just want to keep going with this for just another moment. So our carrying value is now $85,000 minus the two years worth of depreciation, 17,000 plus 13,600, a total of 30,600. So our carrying value is now at the end of two years down to 54,400. And so in year three, depreciation is 10,880. How much depreciation would we have recorded under the straight line method in year three? Eight thousand five hundred, exactly the same amount as we reported in year one and year two. So at the end of three years under straight line, we would have reported a total of twenty five thousand five hundred dollars in depreciation. Using the double declining balance method, we've reported over $41,000, almost half of the cost in the first three years. It's called an accelerated method because we front load that depreciation where we're writing off more at the beginning of the asset and less at the end. 
until we run out of depreciation to report. Our numbers in here. As I said, if there had been a residual value, we would have seen even a more dramatic difference because for the straight line method, we're we start out with the depreciable cost. We've already subtracted that residual value. So just as an example, if we had said this would have a $10,000 residual value under straight line, we would have reported 75,000 divided by 10, only $7,500 per year. Double declining balance method would be exactly the same because we don't take into account the residual value until the end. Taking. For the straight line method, there would be. For the double declining balance, there wouldn't be on an annual basis. The total depreciation that we would report, again, using my example, let, I said, let's pretend it said there was a $10,000 residual value. In that case, the depreciable cost would be the $85,000 historical cost minus my fictitious $10,000 residual value. The depreciable cost would be only $75,000. So under both methods, if that was the case, under both methods, as well as under the units of activity method, the total depreciation would be $75,000. So if there's a residual value, then yes, we report less depreciation in total. But the annual depreciation under double declining balance method is not affected by the, by the residual value. Straight line method is. And if we look back at the formulas, if I get that stuff off my screen, if we look back at the formulas, you can see why that is the case. The straight line method starts with depreciable cost, which already has removed that estimated residual value. Double declining balance method starts with the carrying value. And the carrying value doesn't say anything. Of, whoops, why won't you let me highlight? The carrying value calculation doesn't say anything about residual value. It's historical cost minus accumulated depreciation. But when we first start using the asset, there is no accumulated depreciation yet. We haven't recorded depreciation until the end of that first period. So double declining balance only takes the residual value into account at the end of the calculation, at the end of its life. And straight line takes it into account from day one. Does that answer your question? Let's look at my green check marks in there. So we have now in these two, these last two exercises, talked about all three methods of reporting, for recording, calculating depreciation. So we started with how do we, in exercise one, how do we record it? What do we record when we acquire an asset? Now in these past two exercises, we've looked at, we're using the asset for its intended purpose. As we're using it, we're recording depreciation. The expense hits the income statement and reduces our net income. The accumulated depreciation reduces the carrying value of that asset on our balance sheet. And we just go along using the asset until we're done with it. When we acquired the asset, we had to estimate how long we were going to use it. It's part of all three calculations. If you go back to those formulas, all three calculations include as part of the calculation, the estimated useful life, estimated useful life, estimated useful life, the two that we just did, straight line and double declining balance, estimated in passage of time. The units of activity method estimates it based on some other measure of usefulness that we as the company decide. How are we going to know how much we've used it? How are we going to make that decision? So we're using the asset, we're recording depreciation. We have 
when we acquired the asset, estimated how long we expect to use it based on some measure, passage of time, units of production. Now, it was an estimate of how long we would use it. And we may end up using it for more or less than that time. There is nothing that says if we estimated, we're looking at this exercise, when we acquired this Kubota tractor, we said, we'll probably use it for 10 years. That seems reasonable. But maybe at the end of seven years, the engine blows up. And we say, hmm, I know we said we were going to use it for 10 years, but fixing that's going to be really expensive. And so at that point, we might, might decide, let's fix the engine, but then we'll plan to use it for 12 years. We can extend that. Or maybe when the engine blows up at the end of seven years, we say, it's not worth fixing. We're just going to sell it as is and buy a new one, replace it with a new tractor or some other piece of equipment maybe. Or maybe we decide we don't even need it anymore. There's nothing that says we have to stop using an asset just because we've used it for the, the period of time we thought we would. Maybe we buy a car and we think we'll drive it for 50,000 miles. And at the end of 50,000 miles, we say, it's still in really good shape. Let's just keep it. We may make some adjustments. We may add, you know, lower that residual value and continue reporting depreciation. We may, like in the case of this tractor, we had already calculated that over the 10 years, we'll use up all of that original cost. So at the end of 10 years, we would say the tractor is fully depreciated. On our balance sheet, the book value or carrying value is zero. So we can see we paid 85,000 for it. We can always see the historical cost. And we've told, we fully depreciated it. It's worth zero. It doesn't really mean it's worth zero to us. We can continue to use it for the next seven years or longer, if that's what makes sense. We just don't have any additional depreciation to report because we already reported all of it. I'm going to go back to my presentation just for a moment. Let me just fast forward. Whoops, far too far. Fast forward here. Our next asset, or, sorry, our next exercise is about partial year depreciation. And as I had pointed out in that Kubota tractor exercise, it told us we acquired it on, this, on January 8th. And I pointed out to you that that was in the first half of the first month. If we place the asset into service at any time other than the first half of the first month, we will have to prorate that depreciation for the first, um, for the first year, for the first accounting period. And unless I guess I, I thought I had something else I wanted to show you in that in that um, PowerPoint, but I guess I don't. So let's go to our next exercise and put this into practice. I don't ever like to go through the examples in the PowerPoint. We have our own examples to do. It seems much more useful than reading someone else's example. Exercise four is for partial year depreciation. And we are going to do these calculations for two of the methods, the straight line method and the double declining balance method. Equipment acquired at a cost of $105,000, that's our historical cost, has an estimated residual value of $12,000. That's how much we expect it to be worth when we're done using it. And an estimated use of mm -hmm. life of 10 years. It was placed into service on May 1st of the current fiscal year, which ends on December 31st. So the first four months of the, of the fiscal year, January, February, March, April, we did not have this in service. We had it in service for only eight months of that year. So let's see how we would do this under the straight line method. First thing we have to do is calculate our depreciable cost which is historical cost less the estimated residual value. So 
We expect to use up $93,000 worth of that original or historical cost. We expect to use the asset for 10 years. And so our full year annual depreciation would be $9,300 per year. Everyone good so far? Our full year depreciation will be $9,300 per year. But in the first year, we did not have it for January, February, March, April. We may have had it, I should say, but it wasn't in service yet. It was placed into service on May 1st. And so that's when the depreciation starts, when it becomes part of our normal course of operation. So that $9,300 per year equates to $775 per month, $775 per month, and we used it for eight months of the year. Total of $6,200. And so, in the first year, when we're reporting a partial year, eight of the 12 months of the year, our depreciation would be $6,200. And for year two through 10, we would report $9,300. And then in year 11, we would report the final four months of depreciation, four at $775 or $3,100, the remaining depreciation that we didn't report in year one we would report in year 11, assuming that we actually use this equipment for 10 years. Make sense? Let's go on to double declining balance then. Now remember, double declining balance does not take into account the residual value on the front end. So the formula from Blackboard, two divided by the useful life, estimated to be 10 years, times the carrying value. At the time we acquired the equipment, there is no depreciation yet. And so the carrying value is the full historical cost of $105,000. Oh. And so the full, the full first year of depreciation would have been $21,000. But we only used it for eight out of the 12 months. So I need to prorate that. We're going to take eight twelfths. Of that amount, $14,000. In the first year, we would report $14,000 worth of depreciation. Still significantly more than under the straight line method. Now we have to calculate year two. Same formula, two divided by the useful life times the new carrying value. And so the carrying value at the end of year one, throughout year two, full historical cost 105,000 minus the accumulated depreciation. We've recorded $14,000 worth of depreciation at this point. And we're going to be reporting a full year of depreciation. We don't have to do any prorating like we did in year one. So when I plug that into my trusty calculator, I got eighteen thousand two hundred dollars. At the end of year two, we have reported a total of. 
$15,500 of depreciation under straight line and $32,200, more than twice as much under double declining balance. Remember in the previous exercise, it was exactly twice as much in the, uh, in the first year, exactly twice as much. And the only reason it was exactly twice as much is because of the, the lack of a residual value. Here, from year one in straight line to year one in double declining balance, it is more than twice as much because of that residual value. Because for this exercise, there is a residual value. Yep, you're going to add. So the question in the classroom was, in the double declining balance method, this accumulated depreciation piece, is that the total of all of the depreciations from the prior years? And the answer is yes. Yep. If I were to set up an, a T account, and you would be able to see it. And so I would recommend that you might consider doing that. If you're doing a double declining balance calculation that maybe goes beyond a couple of years, it's easier to keep track if you can see the depreciation from year one, year two, year three, and, and so on. It becomes even more important as you get closer to the end of the useful life of that asset because you only want to report as much depreciation as you calculated that depreciable cost to be. And when you're using double declining balance, you can actually, I don't know if this is the right term, but over depreciate. You can record too much depreciation if you just go along using the same calculation. Um, we have five minutes left. I think we can get through this exercise, so let's give it a shot. If not, we will just stop when we run out of time and we'll pick up with this exercise on Thursday. So this exercise says a building with a cost of $1.8 million, an estimated residual value of $125,000, and we thought we were going to use it for 40 years. A estimated useful life of 40 years. Remember, I've already explained that just because we thought we were going to use it for 40 years doesn't mean that we actually have to use it for 40 years. And that's what we're going to see in this exercise is that the company you, the, who owns this building said, mm, yeah, it's not gonna make it 40 years. We need, to, we need to make some changes here. So let's just start um, letter A. What is the amount of annual depreciation under the straight line method? So go ahead and try this on your own. Calculate the annual depreciation under the straight line method. using the formula that we introduced and the formula is in Blackboard if you need it. So I found the annual depreciation of $41,875. I took the original or historical cost, I subtracted the estimated residual value to find the depreciable cost. Then I divided by the estimated useful life to find the cost per year, $41,875. Any questions on that? So now we're asked to find what's the book value at the end of 28 years. We're assuming 
that it was full year depreciation, even though we just did that exercise with partial year. We're going to assume it was 28 full years of depreciation. And so my first step is to find the total accumulated depreciation. So the total depreciation at the end of those 28 years would be 1,172,500. Then I need to subtract that from the original cost. So 1.8 million minus the accumulated depreciation will give us the book value. So this company, this entity has been going along using this building for 28 years, recording it's dutifully $41,875 a year at the end of every year. And now we get to the end of year 28, the book, our books, our records, our balance sheet now shows that the building is worth 627,500. Everybody good so far? Okay. Here's where something changes. At the start of the 29th year, they looked at the building and said, it's not going to last 12 more years. In fact, we think it's only going to last five more years. And at the end of those five years, it's not going to be worth 125,000 like we thought it would at the end of 40 years. But in fact, it's only going to be worth 80,000. So the company, because it has new information that the estimates it made up front are not accurate, they have to revise their depreciation. And so as we run out of time here, let's look at what that would look like. Well, the current book value is 627,500 and they think that it's only going to be worth 80,000 at the end of five more years. So that means they have $547,500 left to depreciate and that needs to be depreciated over five years. Still using straight line. And so by, by my calculation, the company needs to bump their depreciation up to $109,500 for the, each of the remaining five years. The huge difference, it's more than twice as much, almost two and a half times as much, big difference. But think about what changed. There are two of their estimates that that, that number, the 42,000 a year was based on, estimated residual value, estimated useful life, both of them were too high. And so now they're kind of playing catch up. And yes, it's going to make them look worse for the next five years than probably was realistic. But in fact, for the last 28 years, now we know we were recording not enough expense. We should have been recording more each of those 28 years. Doesn't mean we did anything wrong. We did the best we could. We didn't know. Something changed. I don't know what changed, but something changed. Or we just weren't very good at estimating. If we are out of time, I, we are already over time. So um, anyone have any questions before I stop the recording? Okay, see you on Thursday.